Theological Studies at Concordia University. He's also a research associate at Sefer and with the Center for Research on Religion, CREOR, as well as a digital fellow at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, MIGS. In 2017, Dr. Gagné was the Director d'Études Invité de l'École Pratique des Halles Études in Paris for his work on the Gospel according to Thomas. His teaching and research focuses on the Christian right, fundamentalism, religious violence, and the interpretation and reception of the Bible. In his public scholarship, Dr. Gagné seeks to explain how sacred texts and traditions are used by fundamentalist groups and individuals to cultivate violent ideas and or incite political religious violence. He also has a marked interest in studying the beliefs, practices, and political inclina inclinations of the dominant See, this is English. I should yeah, that's English. This. You should be of uh, divinist mo movements such as the New Apostolic Reformation and Christian Reconstructionism. His topic is going to be how can we interpret the Gospel of Thomas? Dr. Gagne takes it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, this kind invitation. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here amongst you. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't attend the other lectures, uh, family obligations, research uh, <laughs> stuff, and uh, it's life. But uh, I'm very, very happy on this nice day. And finally, we're starting to get uh, decent we weather, and let's hope it continues. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the Gospel of Thomas. This is part of uh, the interests I have concerning uh, the interpretation and reception of Scripture. Uh, like Jonathan uh, said, I, I have multitude, uh, a multitude of interests uh, going from uh, Christian right fundamentalism and radicalization. But for about 15 years of my life, I've been studying this text. And I will be uh, just uh, talking to you about uh, an upcoming commentary that's coming out uh, in uh, June of this. It's actually a, a new translation, introduction, and commentary on the Gospel of Thomas mm -hmm. in English which is uh, great. So how can we interpret the Gospel of Thomas? It is a enigmatic text. Uh, it is a collection of sayings, as you know. This is a famous, uh, famous uh, uh, portion of the text. It's actually the introduction of the Gospel of Thomas. We have uh, a title that is on the left page. It's the ending. Uh, it's uh, what is called the colophon. Mm -hmm. So the ending of the previous tractate, which is uh, the Apocryphon of John, mm -hmm. and then right after the Apocryphon of John, you have the incipit, or the opening lines of the Gospel according to Thomas. And the title of the Gospel of Thomas is found at the end of the text, uh, the colophon mm -hmm. at the end of the text. So just to kind of, uh, probably some of you are aware of this information, maybe some of you are less aware, but I, I thought it would be important to just say a few words about uh, what it is, where it was discovered in 1945, as you know, uh, the collection of Nagamati texts, which is located uh, in the middle, pretty much in the middle of, of Egypt, a uh, collection of 13 codices, uh, 52, or some say between 52 and 54 tractates, and the Gospel according to Thomas itself is found in Codex 2, uh, Tractate 2. So it follows the Apocryphon of John, and it just it, it comes before the Gospel according to Philip, which is another fascinating text uh, that can often be read uh, in echo with some of the ideas that we find in the Gospel according to Thomas. Now, this text is a collection of sayings. Now, scholarship, uh, modern scholarship, has divided the text into 114 sayings. But very early on, uh, you had uh, various types of divisions concerning the text. Uh, for example, I, I'm thinking of Rudolf Cassin in his early commentary. Uh, one of the first commentaries in French on the Gospel of Thomas, he has over 200 sayings. Oh. So he had divided the sayings uh, differently. At one point, uh, there was a standardized division. 
uh, and it came down to 114 sayings. Most of these sayings uh, are introduced by a formula, a very basic formula, PJ Jesus J, Jesus said. And then you have the content of, of what Jesus says in, in the book. Uh, in the tractate. Now, uh, concerning uh, this, in, in some cases, most, like I said, of, of, these, of these sayings are introduced with this formula, but sometimes they aren't. And sometimes scholars will just supplement this, uh, taking, making the assumption that Jesus here is actually introducing the saying, but we can't know for sure, okay? Now, it's written on 19 papyrus leaves, the only complete text that we have of the Gospel according to Thomas is the Coptic text. So this is the text that was found at Nagamadi. It's, it's quite well preserved compared to other uh, texts. I'm thinking about the Dialogue of the Savior, for example, which is pretty damaged, a lot of holes. Gospel according to Thomas is, is quite, you know, quite well preserved. And uh, it was written in Coptic. So what we have at, at Nagamari is Coptic. So I remember when I started my doctoral studies, I was still looking around, you know, what am I going to do, what am I going to research? And uh, at one point, I was interested in the correspondence between what we find in the Synoptic Gospels, in the New Testament Synoptic Gospels, and I had kind of been introduced a bit to the Gospel of Thomas, but I was by far, you know, no expert. I was just interested, interested in the text. And I, I started uh, noticing these similarities between the Synoptic tradition and Thomas. And uh, so I knew Greek because I had done my master's in Greek. Uh, I had done it on the Gospel according to John, so I had learned Greek. But I didn't know at the time that I had to learn Coptic. So that was another thing. So you have to get, uh, you know, you, ha you have to get the languages. But um, I was happy to actually discover that Coptic was much easier than Greek. I'm teaching Biblical Greek now, even in the summer. I, I, I taught a Biblical Greek one to a, an, undergrad, an undergrad class in the winter, and they wanted to literally die at the end of that first semester. And I told them, you know, you have to take Biblical Greek two because you did one. Why don't you do two? You know, you're, you're almost done. So I lost a few players, but you know they're 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 suicidal. So they're they're in my a second class now, and it's twice a week, three hours a, each time. So they're in my class. I'm teaching them tomorrow, and on Thursday they have their first midterm, and they're pretty much freaking out. So, but you know I was happy that okay, Coptic is not too bad compared to uh, Greek. So, so I learned Coptic, but but you know when I met my thesis supervisor. Uh, at the time, uh, because I, I was I was doing part of my PhD was at l'Université de Montréal here, and um, I had to find a, a conjoint uh, supervisor. So I had to find a specialist on Thomas. We didn't have any specialist on Thomas in uh, at l'Université de Montréal. So um, my my supervisor knew of a specialist on Thomas uh, in Europe. So his name was Jean-Marie Sevrin. And he was the top scholar in the French-speaking world on the Gospel of Thomas. And uh, when I met him the first time, he said, are you sure you really want to get involved <laughs> in the Gospel according to Thomas? Because he says, I've been struggling with this text for the past 20 years, and I can't wrap my, my, my own mind around the text. So are you really sure you want to get... So I said, yeah, okay, you know, I, I should, yes, it, it, it's interesting, I see these parallels, but you know, when you're doing it, and when you're doing your PhD on it, at one point you feel you're literally like in a desert. <laughs> and you say to yourself, what did, my, what did I get myself into? And when I accepted to do this commentary that's going to, that's coming out in June, it took me a lot of time, because you can't just sit down and write a commentary. You have to think about the text, you have to, you have to run the text over, and you, you, you have to explore what others have said. But again, you want something fresh. Uh, you just don't want to repeat what everybody has, uh, has said. And there's other commentaries for that. So why should I write a commentary that says what it, uh, other people say? But so 15 years after, you know, I, it's, it's been a nice journey in the end. So let's come back to this now, just to. Uh, get into the text. So the complete text is Coptic. Um, 
what, what we discovered uh, is that there was uh, certain Greek fragments, there were certain Greek fragments that had been found at the end of the 20th, uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, yeah, end of 20th century, beginning, uh, in 19th century, beginning of 20th century, sorry. Um, and these fragments were found in another place called Oxyrhynchus, which is a garbage dump, in fact, mm -hmm. near Cairo, not too far from Cairo. And we found a lot of different scraps of fragments of all sorts of, of things. There's, there's an entire collection on, on Oxyrhynchus fragments. At the time, those that edited the fragments, Grinfeld and Hunt, um, they had found three scraps of you know, papyri in Greek that they labeled just sayings of the Lord. That's how they called these fragments. They were just called sayings of the Lord. They didn't know what they were. So you're at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay? So when we discovered in 1945 the Coptic text, then those people, you know, people that knew about the Oxyrhynchus papyri, they said, ah, you know, some of the content that we have on the Oxyrhynchus papyri is very similar to what we find in the Coptic text. Even if the Coptic is Coptic and the Greek is Greek, but you have this formula, Jesus said, Jesus said. And when you do a retroversion from Coptic to Greek, then you can kind of have a sense of, okay, this probably was very similar to the Oxyrhynchus fragments. Now the Oxyrhynchus fragments, these three fragments, P Oxy 654, P Oxy 1, and P Oxy 655, uh, these fragments, uh, they contain about 20 sayings of the 114 sayings. They don't contain all the sayings, there are differences also between the, the uh, Greek fragments and, the Co and what we know in, in the Coptic. Um, and they are three fragments from three different papyrus. Mm. Okay? In some cases, behind or, or the, the, the verso of those fragments, in some cases, is a shopping list. <laughs> mm. okay? So you kind of wonder what kind of status these, the, these sayings of Jesus have for these people that just recopied these sayings. You know, maybe someone on the corner of a table just copied, just for remembrance, mm -hmm. just copied sayings of Jesus behind, you know, at the verso of a shopping list. Okay? So here you have, at the bottom, you have uh, the beginning of the Coptic. This is what Coptic look like, looks like. It's very similar, in fact. Most of the Coptic letters correspond to Greek letters capital Greek letters. There's a couple of additional letters, but for the most part, if you know how to read Greek in the sense you know how to pronounce some of these letters in Greek, you can read Coptic. You might not understand it, yeah. but you, <laughs> you'll be able to, to read parts of it. Very interesting. Uh, as you notice, most of, uh, of, most of the, the, the manuscripts that we discover, even those of the New Testament, uh, they are uh, manuscripts that don't have any divisions between words. Um, here we have a very small exception where there seems to be an indention, an indentation, but it's very rare in manuscripts. All the words are, you know, bunched together. Uh, so these are, so you, you get to learn that. Uh, you get to recognize these words, and, and it's fun to be able to work on the text itself in its original language. It's, it's satisfying when you're doing your commentary or you're, you're writing a paper on this that you've actually produced your own, your own translation. Now, and just a few words concerning the Oxyrhynchus. Uh, these are images of the Oxyrhynchus. Um, when I was doing my initial research, it was fun because I could go to the Houghton Library, and I went to the British Library, and I went to uh, the uh, Bodleian to actually look. You know, you look at history in your in your hands, and you look at these fragments, and it's it's you know you're you're in awe before, you know, of what you uh, of what you discover. So. Uh, the, the one on the left is P. Oxy 655. Um, 
that uh, that uh, it corresponds to roughly to sayings one to seven of uh, the Coptic text. The other one is Pioxy one, <laughs> one, which is corresponds to um, sayings um, twenty six to thirty three and a portion of saying 77, the, sef the, the second part of saying 77 is merged to saying uh, 30. And the other one is Pioxy 655, and it corresponds to saying 24, and sayings 36 to 39. Now, there are differences uh, between these texts. Now, these, these fragments are dated somewhere on paleographical grounds, are dated somewhere between 200 and 250 common era. That's on paleographical grounds. Now for Coptic, uh, for, for Greek, I, I should say, it's, we have more things to compare, you know, to work with, pa pa with paleography because we have a lot of manuscripts in Greek. Coptic is more tricky to date, okay? Uh, Coptic scholars, because there are people that just do Coptic, you know, and they just study Coptic manuscripts. That's what they're, they do, that's their research. Uh, they have a hard time dating manuscripts. It's very difficult on paleographical grounds to date Coptic manuscripts Sorry. compared. Yes. Paleography is? Pa it's the study of writing, okay? Writing and specific, uh, specific kind of writing. So sometimes if um, you know, a series of texts have been dated, they are compared to that you know, series of manuscripts and say, okay, this corresponds to a, a second century Han. Mm -hmm. The way the writing is, 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 is elaborated, the types of words that are used, the connection between words, um, even the types of letters, how they are yeah. actually written. Uh, sometimes they're going to be, e they're, they're even going to be able to locate, ge geographically speaking, what kind of writer mm -hmm. wrote at you know this text. Because geographically speaking, a lot of the text that we found, you know, correspond to this type of writing in that geographical location. So this is interesting. In, in the commentary that I wrote, I, I, I do talk about this, but. You can't get much out of this because these are fragments, and the best that you can get out of it of these fragments is if you do comparative work with 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 the Coptic, because apart from that, there's nothing much more than saying, okay, these are sayings of Jesus, and at the same time, we have to ask ourselves the question: Are these sayings the Gospel of Thomas? Mm -hmm. You see, they might not be the Gospel of Thomas. They might just be free-floating sayings that eventually ended up in the Gospel according to Thomas as we have it as a finished product in the Coptic text itself, you see? So they might not, it might be best not even to label them as being the Greek fragments of the Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about Greek fragments of Jesus' sayings that have corresponding elements with the Coptic text. Yes, Jonathan. And alternately, could this be like the Gospel of Steve? Like this could be a, a, absolutely a, a, another Gospel that yeah, uses yeah, yeah. Thomas as a source. Yeah, yeah. Or that Thomas is using. Yeah, it. absolutely. Yeah. Or the other way around. Yeah. Exactly. We don't know. You see. Yeah. So this is why I'm prudent. I still have to include it in a commentary because it's standard and pe it, it's pretty much a received notion that this, you know, okay, these are corresponding sayings to the Coptic stuff. But I always have like this reticence on, on my part to really label this as uh, the Gospel of Thomas in Greek. I would rather talk about this Jesus at Oxyrhynchus, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, sayings of Jesus at Oxyrhynchus instead. You know, it's safer. Do any do yes. any of the Oxyrhynchus fragments fill in uh, any of the lacunae in the uh, Coptic text? Uh, that's it. Yeah, yes, because the thing is, the Coptic text is 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 well preserved. Right. So there's no where we have issues. Uh, we know what the Coptic text says. Mm -hmm. You see. Mm -hmm. So it, so some scholars that like to work in in retro version and in, in taking Coptic and bringing it back to Greek. They will use the Coptic to fill out the holes that right. we have here. Right. Yeah. 
you know. Um, yeah, because it's a very well preserved text. Okay. 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 Now, for the Coptic text, because this is what is the most interesting thing, the Coptic text, even if it's hard paleographically, it's almost like a, res a received idea that the Coptic text is usually understood as being dated around the middle of the fourth century. So somewhere between the middle of the fourth century, 350 to, three, uh, to, to 400 common era, uh, you can you can safely say okay we're we're in that kind of time period for the Coptic text, uh, especially they were found in Egypt uh, near uh, a Pacomian monastery. Uh, there's more research now that is done in connecting the Nagamadi tractates to Pacomius, um, you know Egyptian Christianity. Uh, which is very interesting uh, because there's a lot of stuff that we find in Pacomian Christianity um, that resonate a lot with what we read in the Gospels, uh, in the Gospel of, of uh, Thomas, but what we read even elsewhere in Nagamadi. Okay, so this is another kind of new venue of research uh, that that is now explored, especially by a team of scholars. Uh, from Oslo, I have colleagues from Oslo that have that, that are reading Thomas and that are reading Nagamadi in a monastic Egyptian context. It's fascinating in and of itself. Okay, so Coptic text three fifty ish. Now, our purpose is to how do we interpret the Gospel of Thomas? Like when the Gospel of Thomas was was found or figured out, this became the most important text of all the Nagamadi collections. Why would you think people were fascinated by the Gospel of Thomas? What's your, what's your opinion about, on that? Why, would you, why do you think that the mo most of the scholarship that has ever been done on Nagamadi has been on the Gospel of Thomas? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, but I really want to hear Clark. One, yeah. it's, uh, it's a lot easier to read. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when you sit down and read Secret John, like, it, it gives, I love it, but it gives me a headache and I feel dizzy. Yeah. Uh, Gospel of Thomas, you can literally read it in 20 minutes, it's fast. And then the second thing is, is that everything seems very profound, but not, you, you can interpret it. Um, it's, it's very profound, but it's kind of flexible. It's a lot easier to read your own reading into it because it's a bit mysterious. And sorry, a third theory is that we have a, uh, a mystical wisdom Jesus who in many ways is different from, from what we have in um, uh, uh, the canonicals. So those, yeah. those are my three. Yeah, my three very points. good, very good, Jonathan. Yes? Well, Thomas uh, backed up the theory that there was a collection of saints. Yes, yes, that comparable to Q, right? Eh? Yeah. To the Kuvendi. This, this, this goes to understanding Q. Yeah, what, what is, uh, yeah, scholars of uh, the synoptics, uh, they come, you know, the, the synoptics are problematic for a lot of scholars because they almost say the same thing, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, scholars, to kind of solutionize what has been called the synoptic problem, they came up with the two source hypotheses which Mark is the, uh, uh, Mark is the, is the first gospel since it is shorter. It's the first gospel and it's the base source of Matthew and Luke. Uh, so all the common material between Mark, Matthew and Luke come from, comes from Mark. But all the common material between Matthew and Luke absent from Mark comes from another source called Kvele or Q. Kvele uh, in, in German, which means source, okay, the Q source. But the Q source does not exist, okay? This does not exist. This is a reconstruction. This is a scholarly reconstruction. Nobody ever found a document called Q. Right. <laughs> they never found a document called Q, but I have, I have colleagues that did a... 700 page critical edition of Q. <laughs> okay? So. Sorry, a point of clarification, if yeah. you can correct me. So you're saying that the, one of the reasons this text is popular is because scholars look at it, they already love Q, we don't have Q. This proves that something like Q exists. Hence, scholars are drawn to this book. Yes, and, and it would have been something like that. Q can exist. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, the other issue is that it, it is very similar to the material that we find in the canonical gospel. Uh -huh. yes. You see, so this is intriguing. I don't know, what is this? So from the start, all sorts of hypotheses uh, started to arise among scholars. Okay, what do we do with this? Where, where does this come from? So there were two major schools for a long time, and there's, I have to say that there's still no consensus with respect to uh, source, the sources of Thomas. Okay? There's no consensus. It's split down the middle. So you have what is called the independence from the New Testament school. So this is especially American with scholars like uh, uh, James Robinson, who is uh, responsible for the uh, uh, Nagamati uh, critical edition in English. Uh, Helmut Kirstein, who is a very, very influential uh, scholar uh, that was based at Harvard. And Stephen Patterson, who is still uh, very much active in, in the Gospel of Thomas uh, studies, is actually the one responsible for the next critical edition of the Gospel of Thomas in the Hermeneia uh, commentaries, which is a very, very prestigious uh, commentary, a series of commentaries on New Testament and, and biblical texts. Now, this postulates the idea that Thomas does not depend on the New Testament, that Thomas is an a, 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 a autonomous tradition. Mm. Okay, so it's completely independent from the New Testament uh, material, even if there are similarities. Thomas would have had his sources not in the New Testament, but maybe from sources that the New Testament itself had, mm -hmm. but it's not dependent on the New Testament. Okay, so it's independent. Now, there is another, uh, another school of thought, which is the dependence. Okay, so the first one, by the way, the first one situates Thomas very early in dating as an original text. So we don't have any original text. Even the, the Greek fragments that I told you, they're not original. Okay, they're copies of a Greek text, but they're not original. Okay, and the Coptic text is not original. Okay, so let's say we talk about the independence, let's say we would go back to an original text that doesn't exist, but at one point had to be put down, okay, had to be written. The, the school for, it, for, for independence of Thomas situates the, the origins of Thomas in the middle of the first century, okay? Near the dating of Q, okay? Very early, okay? It's a sayings gospel, very early. And they base themselves on the genre, a sayings gospel. You see, uh, they, they speculate that sayings gospels, uh, when they don't contain any narrative material, are more primitive mm -hmm. than gospels that have narrative material. Uh, this is just an assumption. Okay, we don't have any proof that it means that it necessarily is earlier because you have sayings of the Desert Fathers that are dated in the second and third <coughs> century. Okay, yes? Sorry, so would, would school one say that the text comes from like the first decades after, yeah. after Jesus? Yeah. Okay. Middle of the first century. Two, yeah. okay. yes. Now, uh, the uh, proponents of the dependence are those that say that Thomas was composed after the New Testament and depends on the New Testament, okay? So you have a bunch of scholars, often more European, uh, Christopher Tuckett, uh, Jean-Marie Sevrin was my, my supervisor. It's based on the, uh, the work of uh, uh, Wilhelm Schrage in, in, the, in the 60s, uh, big, big, work on, on the Coptic text and retroversions into the Greek and comparing Coptic versions of the New Testament with the Coptic Thomas. It was phenomenal work. And Nicholas Perrin. Now these people will situate the writing of, the, of an original text of Thomas around the middle of the second century. So you're about, you know, a hundred years later. So the New Testament itself is already in, in circulation. Thomas incorporates in his own writings 
uh, you know, traditions that he inherits from the New Testament. Now, you can say, okay, it's either or. I myself take a more middle ground perspective on this in the sense that both can be right. <laughs> okay? It's, but it's just more complex than it's just all dependent or non-dependent. Everything is dependent, everything is independent. It's more complicated than that. Um, it's, 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 it's a combination of both. And, and this middle ground perspective, when you look at the sources, you have to take every saying on its own. And, and look at what is, how a saying is articulated, and then do the textual critical work and source critical work in relation to that specific saying. Okay? But now you're not, you're not touching at the meaning of Thomas yet. But by doing that work, that comparative work from a source critical, redactional critical perspective, you're able to see the distinctions that Thomas has in comparison to the synoptic tradition. Now, that middle ground position is this. Essentially that in some cases, the Gospel of Thomas preserves traditions that are probably later than what we have in the New Testament. Okay? So that means that there are traditions in Thomas that maybe the, the, the compiler of these sayings inherited from the New Testament, okay? Uh, take, for example, this, uh, this little uh, uh, beatitude, okay? Which is a very interesting beatitude uh, in Thomas in, in saying 54. Jesus said, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Very basic. Uh, we have in Luke chapter 6 and we have in Matthew. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you see what's interesting here. Uh, in this case, you have almost like a combination in the Gospel of Thomas of elements from Luke and, and, and Matthew. You see? So some scholars, a lot of scholars would say, ah, you see, the writer of Thomas probably had access here to both of these traditions, but he kind of worked those traditions and made something unique to him. But at the same time, we have a sense that he's close with respect to the kingdom of heaven. He's close to Matthew. But he doesn't specify the idea of poor in spirit that we have in Matthew. This is only the poor in Luke. Okay? So there's probably here, and I say probably because we weren't there and we can't ask the person, did you inspire yourself from Matthew and Luke? Or did you know these traditions? We can't. But there are good reasons on textual critical grounds to say, okay, probably this is a tradition that... Thomas inherited from the synoptic tradition. And that's okay. You know, it doesn't change anything because at the same time, Thomas probably wasn't a text that was composed in one setting. Okay, in just one sitting, the guy just wrote <laughs> everything down. You know? It's probably something that's, that, that started very early, like a small kernel of sayings on which things aggregated themselves progressively in time. And what we have at the end of the, uh, the, you know, this middle of the, uh, the fourth century is the version that we have, okay? Um, yeah. Yes, Jonathan. Sorry, I'm also getting some clarification for the people at home. So, so, so it's like, it's, it's a fluid living text where, yeah. where you have a core and people are adding to it. So, so maybe they wrote down some sayings of Jesus that they received perhaps in the first century. Yeah. Then somebody in the second century who is reading uh, Luke and Matthew is adding in another saying. Yeah, absolutely. There's okay. all of that. Those are all possibilities. All possibilities. Um, uh, we'll never know. Yeah, we'll never know for sure. This is why at one point you have to stop speculating and yeah. start interpreting the text. <laughs> uh, but it's important for people that are introduced to the Gospel of Thomas to at least know that this exists. 
like scholars are engaged in this kind of debate and they have been spilling a lot of ink around these questions and not finding any common consensus on this because it's more complex than what it looks like. There's parts of it that can be tied to orality. Uh, there's all the idea that uh, there's, a, there's this proposition by April DeConnick who has written extensively, she's a professor at Rice University of Early Christian Literature uh, and oh, History. We <laughs> well, I'm sure you do. Uh, where she talks about, uh, she, she takes, she takes his, uh, her idea from um, um, uh, a scholar that has written a commentary on the book of Jeremiah, this idea of a rolling corpus. Hmm where uh, you, know, you, you have this kernel and at one point this corpus just kind of grows with time because there are several um, elements or, or crises. She identifies crises in the Thomasine community, if you believe in a Thomasine community, uh, where those crises contributed to an aggregation of additional elements that have been, you know, added to this initial kernel. So this is, a, this is a hypothesis. We don't know for sure, but it is one plausible way of understanding this. Now, there are in Thomas also traditions and sayings that are completely independent from the synoptic tradition that you won't find in the New Testament. You see, like this here, the Gospel of Thomas 82. Jesus said, whoever is near me is near the fire, and whoever is far from me is far from the kingdom. Okay? Now, you're not going to find this anywhere in the New Testament, but you'll find it in Origen. You'll find it in the works of Didymus the Blind. You'll find it in the pseudo Ephraim the Syrian. This is very, very similar. I'm not going to read the, the, the three of them, but they, they are almost identical, these sayings, to saying... 82, you see? But saying 82 is not in a synoptic tradition. So the compiler has access to other material that he freely just integrates in his, uh, in his collection, in, in his compilation of sayings. And we'll figure out, we're trying to understand how he does this and why he works this way in just a few minutes when we'll get into how we read and interpret Thomas. Because the thing is, you know, with Thomas, and Jonathan was, I, I was glad to hear him say that it seems to be like an interesting text, it's easy to read and everything, but there are people that say Thomas makes no, no sense. <laughs> you see, there's this school of thought that says, you know, Thomas is just a, a bunch of sayings, it's gibberish, it has no coherent meaning, it makes no sense. You can't get anything out of this. You start reading and he's jumping all over the place. And that, that is actually what makes, you know, commentaries on Thomas difficult to do because he actually does that but you have to figure it out you have to figure what he does you have to kind of decipher the network of meaning that he's trying to impose or influence his reader okay it's almost postmodern thomas is postmodern thomas is postmodern now when I say middle ground, it's also this, where Gospel of Thomas can also have traditions that predate the synoptics. You see, they could be either after the synoptics, eh? so he, he integrates material from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, whatever. He integrates material that completely absent from the New Testament. Or he has similar material, but it's prior to what we have in a, in, in a synoptic uh, tradition. Here you have a nice example of this. This is a parable. You know this parable probably very, very well. I'm not going to read the entire parable, but it's the parable of the sower and the, and the various fields and the, the seed that falls among you know, the, good, the good soil, the till, tilled soil, and among the rocks, and the birds come and eat and all of that. And then in Mark 4, I took Mark's version because it's the shortest version and probably if we, if we adopt a synoptic problem type of solution as Mark 1st, so I took Mark 1st, I put Mark 1st, uh, you have this entire parable, but it's much more elaborated, okay? 
So you have a short version in Thomas, very short, and in Mark 4, there's more elements. So it's pretty weird uh, for someone to take away important material. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, there's, this is a scribal principle. Usually, yeah. scribes had a tendency to add yeah. material, not take away material. Okay? So this shorter parable, and even the formulation of the parable, and you look at it in the Coptic, the formulation is very archaic, the way it's, it's actually, you, you have to smooth it out yourself in English, okay? It's very archaic compared to the smoothness that we find in the Greek and in, 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 in Mark's okay. version. The thing is, the fact that it's shorter, the way it's formulated, it, it, it hints to scholars that this predates. So Thomas had a version of the parable that the synoptic writers did not know. Mm. Because just the parable itself in Mark, already the way it's articulated presupposes the interpretation of the parable given later on in mm. verses 3 to 9. You see? So in Mark, okay, the parable is given in verses 3 to 9, but the interpretation, because the disciples don't understand what Jesus is talking about. So Jesus is going to give them in private the interpretation of that parable. Okay? The interpretation that Jesus gives of that parable is already presupposed in the parable itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas in Thomas, you have none of that. You're left on your own to figure it out. You have nothing. Okay, well, how, do I, how do I interpret this? It, it has nothing in it. Whereas Mark, ah, yeah, it makes sense. You know, when Jesus gives the parable, oh, yeah, I knew this. You know, it's, it's clear. Okay, not in Thomas. Mm -hmm. And there's a purpose for that in Thomas. It's purposefully obscure because it's the goal of Thomas. Okay? Thomas wants you to engage on a quest for meaning. Doesn't give you all the answers. Okay? And this brings us to how do we read it? How do we interpret it? Now you have a sense of, okay, what, did, what does the scholarship has, has done and what have they debated for the past 70 years? You know, we just did a collected volume 70 years after Nagamati. Where are we? We're kind of still figuring it out. How do we read it? And that, my commentary, I, I focus more on that. I, of course, I talk about all the historical scholarship, and that's very important. But in the end, my question is, what does Thomas mean? What does Thomas mean? At least, what could have Thomas meant for an implied reader at that time? Okay? What could have it meant? So the authorship is attributed to Didymus Judas Thomas, you know, twin. Huh? He's the twin. Uh, it's interesting that Didymus, the, the, the name Didymus is not found in the uh, Greek fragments. It's just Judas Thomas. There's an emphasis in the Coptic, the twin. Mm -hmm. huh? And to understand Thomas, you have to understand essentially what I call its hermeneutical key. It's interpretative key. And where do you get that? You get that at the beginning of the text. So if you play the game of the text, you'll, you can figure it out. But you have to enter into the text. And you have to play by the rules of that text. You see? So Thomas opens with these, with these words. These are the hidden sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Judas Didymus Thomas wrote down. And he said, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death or will not taste death. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. And when he finds, he will become troubled. And when he becomes troubled, he will be astonished and he will rule over the all, or Petegef uh, is also all things, depending on how you want to understand this. Now, 
This is the hermeneutical key. If you understand and you enter into what the text is calling you as a reader to do, then you can unlock. And what's interesting here is eternal life or life everlasting is tied to the interpretation of the sayings of Jesus. The sayings of Jesus are hidden. What does that mean? Does that mean that you can't read them? No, they're, they're there, they're there. Okay, <laughs> they're clearly there. They're written down. Their meaning is hidden. Okay, this is why it's called hidden sayings or secret sayings, if you want. Okay, so the way to figure this out, essentially, and I worked a lot on this, and you know, I, I talked with my supervisor at the time, and I said, you know, if we take the incipit, this is the opening lines, the incipit, seriously, as scholars. What, is it, what does it ask us? It essentially asks us to engage in a quest for meaning, but how do you do this when you have a collection of sayings that seems to be completely disor you know, disorganized, we don't know where it's going, There's, there doesn't seem to be any coherent structure. How do you do this? The thing is, you have to go back into the Coptic and notice specific things in Thomas. And Thomas works a lot with key terms or catch words. So sometimes what he's going to do is he's going to use a particular word in a sentence or a saying. He's going to word, you know, the, the word kingdom is going to be there. And then the following sentence or saying, you're going to have again the word kingdom, but there's going to be the word child added. And then in the subsequent, you're going to have the word child and so on. And it's like, a, you know, these Russian dolls, <laughs> you know, one into the other. That's how Thomas unfolds itself, essentially. Okay? It's like you're constantly running after the meaning, and it's the responsibility of the reader to make those associations between key terms, catch, catch words, and themes, so that the meaning, you participate as a reader to the construction of meaning. That's how Thomas works. And it was, I was so surprised, actually, to even hear one of the scholars that has worked from a, one of the most historical perspectives on Thomas say this one, at one point, saying, you know, Thomas, you have to adopt another way of reading texts. You have to engage in its hermeneutical program. It's a hermeneutics of penetration. It's a quest for meaning, OK? And you never seem to catch the meaning. You're always running after it. OK? And that's, in a sense, gnosis. You've never really attained it. You're always continuing. You know? And you're, you're questing. And you're seeking. OK? So this is the key. So if we engage in that, and he says, huh? If you continue seeking, you'll find. And when you'll find, you'll be astonished. And you will rule over all things. Now, what is Thomas for me? At one point, I had to give, um, we had, uh, this is coming out. This actually came out. We did a, a conference at Laval University in Quebec City where we had um, the top Nagamati scholars in the world for that conference. It was, uh, and they came up with a book called um, 70 years after Nagamati, where are we? Where are we going? What are we doing? And they gave me the responsibility to talk about Thomas. Like talk about you know, what has been done about Thomas for the past 70 years. And I was thinking, you know, and I was looking at the scholarship and I was a bit depressed, you know, because there's so much mm -hmm. stuff written and so much redundant stuff written and people are not going anywhere. That at one point I was thinking, I said, this makes me think of Paul Gauguin's uh, masterpiece here uh, mm -hmm. that was actually painted at the end of the 18th, uh, 19th century. He was in Tahiti. Uh, and Gauguin was a bit tired of you know, this complexity of social life. And he wanted to find a, a more peaceful and simple life. And he, he went to Tahiti. And he started painting what he was experiencing in nature with the people there. And he came up with that painting uh, in French, and it's actually here at, in the corner. It's there. There's these three, uh, these three uh, 
questions that don't have a question mark, by the way. Where do we come from? D'où venons-nous? Where are we? Who sommes nous? And where are we going? Who am I? And for me, Thomas, that's what Thomas is. Thomas brings you through these three moments. You see? Like, where do we come from? And Thomas is going to kind of unpack that in simple terms, not complicated as, you know, the gospel of truth or others, you know, uh, but very simple terms that we recognize easily, uh, especially people that are familiar with, you know, New Testament writings. Saying 50 is very telling. And I usually connect saying 50 with 49. I think it... Saying 50 to, uh, 49 to, to 52 form a kind of a, a, a structure in and of itself, but I don't have time to talk about this uh, today. But saying 50 is interesting. Jesus said, and, and this is where we come from. Huh? Jesus said, if they say to you, where do you come from? Say to them, we came from the light, the place where the light came into being on its own accord and established itself and became manifest through their image. If they say to you, is it you? <laughs> say, we are his children. We are the elect of the living Father. And if they ask you, what is the sign of your Father in you? Say to them, it is a movement and repose. Or a movement and a rest. So it's a kind of a series of questions. And it's interesting, these series of questions, you're going to find them for example, in the second apocalypse of James, but it's when the soul returns uh, through the, the various uh, aeons uh, through the, and, and tries to go back to the Pleroma and is attacked by the archons. And the archons are asking the soul all of these questions. But here it's not about the journey of the soul going back. It's just questions that are asked, existential questions. Okay? And essentially, where do you come from? We come from the light. We are the children of the light. But for you know a reader that just kind of is new to the Gospel of Thomas, what is that? The light. What are you talking about? The light. You come from the light. And we are the children of light. And who's your father? What is all of this? What what does the the Gospel of Thomas give keys to these you know tropes? Saying six seventy seven, and this is where. Interpreting the Gospel of Thomas requires familiarity with the Gospel of Thomas. <laughs> you have to read Thomas often and many, many, many times. Because when you read it often and you read many, many times, those themes and topics and catchwords, they help you connect sayings together. Jesus said, it is I who am the light which is above them all. It is I who am the all. From me, the all came forth, and unto me, the all extend. So, what's the light? Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he goes further than that. He says, I'm the all. And often the all is, is understood as a, a technical term as the pleroma. Jesus qualifies himself as that. Fascinating when you think about it. And in saying 49, Jesus said, Blessed, so where do you come from? Blessed are the solitary and the elect, for you will find the kingdom, for you are from it, and to it you will return. So these sayings, what they do, they establish a correspondence between Jesus, the light, the all, and the kingdom. These are all synonymous. You find Jesus, you find the kingdom, you find the light, you return to Jesus, you return to the kingdom, you return to Jesus, you return to the all. So essentially what the writer of Thomas is saying is that Everyone originates from the light. 
And if we, you know, if we think there was a Thomasine community, that Thomasine community, that was their self-perception. They were children of the all. They were children of the light. And it's interesting, there's even a saying, it's, it's a strange saying, but um, in, in saying 15, when you see uh, your father uh, fall down on his face, uh, when you see the one not born of a woman, prostate yourself in front of him, for he is your father. <laughs> who is the one not born of a woman? You know, in Christian tradition, who is that? Jesus. Uh, in the sense of uh, not born, because in, in not born carnally. Carnally, carnal, that's it. Yeah. It's in that sense. Okay. So where do we come from? We come from the kingdom. We come from the light. We come from the all. Where are we? Huh. Essentially, the Gospel of Thomas is not negating the reality of the world. You see, a lot of people thought that you know the Gospel of Thomas you know, is not concerned with the world. No, the world is a reality, okay? But you have to react in a particular way in response to the world. Uh, in verse 20, uh, or saying 27, Jesus said, if you do not fast as regard to the world, you will not find the kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath as a Sabbath, you will not see the Father. Now, this seems to be a complex <coughs> saying. There's a lot of people that don't understand this saying. Say, well, what does he mean? Like, if you don't observe the Sabbath as a Sabbath, does he, is, he, is he advocating that people should engage in the Sabbath? Because that could give you that impression. Mm -hmm. Okay? No, but you have to observe the Sabbath as a Sabbath. That means, that literally, you have to Sabbathize the Sabbath, that means not observe the Sabbath. <laughs> you understand? It's an inversion. Because Thomas is actually playing a lot against Judaic practices and beliefs. He's very, very Judaic much against Judaic practices and beliefs. Okay? So you have to fast, you know, from the world as regard to the world. That means you have to you have to die to the world. So it's very similar to taking your cross. Uh, and there's even crucifixion language in, in Thomas, by the way. You have to be. It's very similar even to what you find in Paul. Here, Jesus is going to talk about the reality of the world in saying 28. Jesus said, "I took my place in the midst of the world, and I appeared to them in the flesh. I appeared to them in flesh." I found all of them intoxicated. I found none of them thirsty. And my soul became afflicted for the sons of man because they are blind and in their hearts they do not have sight. For empty they came into the world and empty too they, have, they seek to leave, to leave the world. But for the moment they are intoxicated. When they shake off their wine, then they will repent. So they are dull to the spiritual realities of you know, of, of uh, heaven, of the all, of light. They, they, don't, they don't realize. You know, they're part, they're, they're, they're part of this world, and I came into the world. Huh? So you see, even here, this is very similar to what you find in John chapter 1. Mm -hmm. The word became flesh. So there's no negation of the world in the sense that, you know, Jesus just appeared and, this kind of docetic idea that Jesus was not a, a fleshly person. John, uh, Thomas doesn't talk in those terms. Mm. So Thomas is very uh, realistic in relation to the world. He's very, he knows that the community is part of this world, but they have a responsibility in their reactions to the world. They need to fast from the world. I'm not going to read the other one. Uh, I want to save time. I'm just going to move to the last question of Gauguin's interrogation. Where are we going? Where are we going? Essentially, we're going back to the place we were originally. So in saying 49, and we read it already, blessed are the solitary and elect, huh? for you will find the kingdom, for you are from it, and to it you will return. So essentially, that's how... That's the purpose of Thomas. The purpose of Thomas is to make you realize the state of your origin and that you're on a quest and a journey 
to return back to that origin. And this is very well and beautifully illustrated in the, in the next two sayings. They go very well together, saying 18 and 19. The disciples said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. death. So what's the beginning? The kingdom. Huh? That's where we came from. Huh? That's where you emerged from. So if you understand that, you will not experience death. Um, he continues, blessed is he who came into being before coming into being. That means that existed before even existing now. So he's talking about a, another mode of existence before the mode of existence in this world. So this brings us back into what was Jesus talking about himself as being the point of origin, the light, and that the children are children of light and children of the kingdom. Okay, and you can continue reading the rest. But the ultimate question is this, to, to cap it off. The ultimate question is, how do you get back there? Because it's good to know what it is. It's good to understand, okay, I know the origin. Thomas is clear on telling us where we come from, where we are presently, how we should live in this world, in this present world. And he tells us that we're on a journey back to somewhere. Okay, we're on a journey back to the kingdom. But how do we, how do we get there? How, what, what's this quest? The quest is illustrated through these things. How does... One, return to the kingdom. How does one go back to the state of beginning? How do we do that? And I think it's all tied to the incipit that we read at the beginning. Whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not die. That means you'll have life everlasting. If you have life everlasting, that means you enter the kingdom. So here, how do we get there? Thomas 108, Jesus said, he who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become he. And the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. These are the hidden sayings that Jesus, the living Jesus, spoke and that Judas, Didymus, Thomas wrote down the hidden sayings. You'll have revelation of hidden things. How do you know about these hidden sayings and these hidden things? By drinking from the mouth of Jesus. And what is the outcome of drinking from his mouth, and we'll, we'll try to figure out what that means, that means yeah. okay? Uh, the outcome is a merge of identity where the disciple and the master become one. It is the principle of oneness that is everywhere throughout the, you know, the Nagamati corpus and throughout the Gospel of Thomas. To make two one. Right? To make the inside like the outside, the above like the below. 106. When you make the two one, okay, you will say to, uh, you will become sons of man. Right? The son of man is usually Jesus, but you will become sons of man. And when you say to this mountain, move away, it will move away. You will have authority over all things. Remember, do you remember in the Incipit, it says that if you seek, you will find. When you find, you will be astonished and amazed. And when you'll be amazed, you will rule over all. And here you have an example of ruling over all things. And that saying, that last saying, and I'm going to finish with this, is saying 13, which holds the key to understanding what do you mean by drinking from the mouth of Jesus? 
okay? And having authority over all things. Huh? It's essentially this. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, compare me, tell me who I am like. Hmm. Simon Peter said to him, you're like a righteous messenger. Matthew said to him, you're like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth will utterly not accept that I say whom you are like. Jesus said, I am not your master. Because you drank and you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring, the spring which I have measured up. That's why. And he took him, withdrew, and told them three words. You don't know what these three words are. When Thomas returned to his companions, they asked him, what did he say to you? Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of the words that he said to me, you will take up stones and throw them at me, and a fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. You won't be able to do anything against me. Even the physical elements won't have any power over me. But you see, here, Jesus asks a simple question. Two of the disciples answer inadequately. <laughs> okay? Thomas answers in a particular way, refusing to describe the in, what, what is not describable because Jesus is beyond description. It's very similar to the Gospel of Judas, eh? where uh, Judas is the only one that knows that Jesus comes from the Aeon of Barbello. Mm -hmm. And the other disciples are like, what are you talking about? You know? mm -hmm. But Ju Judas knows. Here Thomas knows certain things, but he's not, he's refusing to engage in, a, in a, any kind of description. And because of that, Jesus says, I'm not your master. That means that he has transcended mm -hmm. the state of discipleship, simple discipleship. He has become, like in saying 109, like the master. I will become he he will become like me. The twin. The twin. That's exactly it. The twinship. The element of twinship here. You see? So this is why he's Didymus. This is why he's Thomas. Okay? And readers are called to become like that. And that's when you will experience the kingdom. The kingdom is tied to the idea of not experiencing death. <laughs> this idea of not experiencing death is tied to the sayings of Jesus. But to be able to correctly interpret the hidden sayings of Jesus, you need to drink from the mouth of Jesus. That means that you need to receive these sayings and meditate and quest and search for their meaning. And when you do that, you will experience enlightenment that will lead you on the path to the kingdom. So that's Thomas. That's how you have to read Thomas. You can understand it beautifully with you know, all the scholarly work that we've done, and I still do, and I, still, and I think it's very important. Scholars need to work on, the, on, these, on this text. But at the same time, if we get you know, boggled down on endless debates on whether Thomas is dependent, independent, is independent, we don't know which sources, what sources, we don't know. We never get to actually read Thomas and try to decipher the meaning. Then why are we doing this? Like, why are we even concerned with these ancient texts? I just want to, and Jonathan asked me to do a little personal plug here. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to tell you that I have a forthcoming commentary on the Gospel of Thomas. It's about 280 pages. Uh, it's going to come out. You can actually pre-order it if you're interested mm -hmm. in this kind of approach to Thomas because what I do in this text is actually try to figure out what it means. Try to create that network of meaning. It's a commentary. Of course, it addresses the important historical questions. We do the comparative work with the Oxyrhynchus papyri. We ask, okay, where has Thomas been plausibly written? Who is Thomas? All of that. We, we, we deal with that. I deal with that in the commentary. But I provide a new translation, and I spend most of the writing commenting and making those associations between sayings 
so that readers can get something out of, of reading Thomas and not come out with the impression, and I'm, I'm glad that Jonathan never had that impression, but with the impression sometimes that you come to Thomas and you don't, you know, I'm just have a, I just have the impression I'm just reading a collection of sayings and they have no connection whatsoever mm -hmm. to each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just like a rep repetition of what I know from the Synoptic Gospels. So this is published at Bripoz. Bripoz is a European publisher. Uh, it's already announced, I think, on Amazon.ca and .com, and it should come out like it's it's in production. So I just reread like all the proofs for about mm. the eighth time. Now. So <laughs> I'm probably never going to read the commentary myself again, but, <laughs> but if you're interested, uh, it's in English. So I just want to. I, I would have loved to have it here, but uh, you know you know how publishers are. Right. It takes time. It's time. <laughs> So thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I appreciate your thank time. Thank you. Yes. Um, you refer to this text using the Gnostic language. Okay? Yes. And um, while there's nothing in the text that is specifically what we would call Gnostic, there's no demiurge, there's no emanations, there's no even mention of gnosis, really. Um, why do you put it in that category? Okay, so this is a this is an excellent question because there's been a big debate around issues around Gnosticism. Even the category of Gnosticism is actually a scholarly construct. We know yes. this. Now, you can uh, I, I I wouldn't classify this text as being part of Gnosticism, but it still is Gnosis in the sense of uh, insight of requesting insight, of, of needing to engage in a quest so that you have insight. The, the, the Coptic word gnosis is in the text, okay? okay? Uh, but you're right in saying that there's no, uh, there's no myth of the demiurge. In the, in the full-fledged myth of the fall of Sophia, there's none of that. Mm -hmm. There might be, and I think there is, there's two veiled references to the demiurge. Uh, that is called God, in fact, in the Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus, when he talks about, the, when Jesus talks about uh, what we consider to be God, like in the positive sense mm -hmm. of God, he's going to refer to that as the Father. Mm -hmm. There's only two places where the word God is used. Uh, one is in uh, saying uh, 30, and the other one is in saying 100. Now, in saying 100, it's interesting the way it's laid out, because saying 100 is, it's the, it's, it's the story about giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. We know that saying eh, from the synoptic tradition. Um, so they, they bring Jesus a gold, a gold coin, which is different from the, uh, the synoptic. It's not gold, it's, it's denarii. Oh. But here it's a gold coin. And uh, so what should we do with this? And, and then Jesus says, uh, what belongs to Caesar, give it to Caesar. What belongs to God, give it to God. And what is mine, give it to me. Now, there's a great gradation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus is above God. Yeah. <laughs> so this is why I think there is a, a veiled notion there of the Demiurge without having the full-fledged myth, myth. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It's not there, Tony. But they, they, there's, there's these kind of veiled references. At one point, um, in, in saying 12, uh, there's uh, the disciples say to Jesus, you know, we know you're leaving. Who are we going to go to when you leave? You know, and uh, Jesus says, uh, listen, you're going to follow James the righteous, for whom heaven and earth has been created. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now James the righteous. Some people think that James the righteous in this in this saying is a positive figure. Mm -hmm. It's not a positive figure. He's a negative figure because heaven and earth have been created for him. And the Gospel of Thomas is very clear that heaven and earth will pass. Mm -hmm. And the heaven be, be, uh, above the heavens will pass also. So heaven and earth are, are not positively seen mm -hmm. in Thomas. So the figure of James is almost like um, the, the representative of the Demiurge in this context. It kind of represents the Demiurge. 
uh, or works for the demiurge. So the disciples will be essentially misled. Yeah, it's a warning. Okay, it's a warning, in fact, and and it fits with the 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 mischaracterization of the other two that follows in saying thirteen, and with with uh, Matthew and Peter uh, misrepresenting who Jesus is. So, yes, you're you're right, and and the thing is, for me, it's still gnosis, without being gnos gnosticism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of this idea of quest um, and the necessity of insight to attain uh, this this uh, life everlasting uh, you know that gnosis for example you have you have the, because sometimes people like gnostics or things like that uh, by the heresiologists they're they're badly ca characterized we know that eh? the, the, like uh, Irenaeus of Dion yeah. and and others Epiphanius that takes over you know the, the heresiology uh, catalogs of Irenaeus and all, and all of that. They, they have a tendency of labeling quote-unquote Gnostics as being here, heretics, okay, yeah. or, or heretical. But it's like these people forget, like people like uh, Clement of Alexandria talks about Gnosis all the time. Mm -hmm. He talks about the Gnostic Christian in a positive term. Mm -hmm. So that's what I see in Thomas. I see this, this Gnosis, this, 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 this need for knowledge, but it's not scholastic knowledge it's insight mm -hmm. it's insight into one's origins and it's it's insight into one's role in the world and how to escape this world or how to return to my place of origin mm -hmm. that's what not that that for me is what thomas says. does that make sense what i said yes, yeah just can i just ask a real sorry uh just a real quick yeah. uh, technical uh yeah. question um, Coptic uh, adopts the Greek loan word theos. Uh, yeah, um, uh, nute. Nute. Oh, okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, it won't, it won't, it won't be a Greco-Coptic word here. So it's nute. Yeah, yeah. Whereas gnosis, gnosis will be gnosis. Yeah. Be the, we, we, in Thomas, you'll have the Greco-Coptic word mm. gnosis, which is interesting, but it's not everywhere. You see. Um, you have, it's, it's, a, it's a complaint that Jesus has towards the, the Pharisees that withhold the, the keys of Gnosis, mm -hmm. the keys of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You see? So he, he talks about the keys of Gnosis here. Okay? Thank uh, you. There was, there was here, here, and there. Okay? We're just going to... Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, okay, you described uh, uh, this uh, uh, text by Thomas as a collection of aphorisms, right? Yeah, so it's essentially aphorisms. Yeah. And then, uh, so it's a bit like, you know, uh, it seems to be at first uh, face value that it's a bit like a collection of thought by Pascal, yeah. Yeah. the analytic of Confucius yeah. or something yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah. So they're all kind of independent sayings, all bunch of them. Yeah. But uh, the way you describe it, uh, you know, about the way you interpret it, it seems to be that actually there is a narrative. It's a, maybe not an organized text, but there is a narrative, but the narrative itself has to be discovered by frequent exposure to the text familiarity. Then at some point in time, we see that the whole text starts to- Make to sense. Uh, Non-connected sentence, but rather, you know, thematic. kind of map, map or thematic. And all. It's and exactly it. This is exactly it. Uh, map, it's a, this is what I call, Constructing a network of meaning. Oh. That's what you do. And, and it's your familiarity with the text that can only bring you to that. Familiarity with the Coptic language also, because you're not going to always recognize you know, those, those catch words mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the translations that you have. So it's good to work with the Coptic and how Coptic works you know, with, with working with catch words. And so, yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's very, it's, you, you got it. Uh, who well, was, not, yeah, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta buy the commentary. Okay, yeah. yeah. My question is also yeah. about constructing the network of meaning. Yes. The way you describe it, it's like a co creative, self interpreting puzzle text. How does this tradition develop? Are you aware of any other texts in the ancient world that do this kind of interpretation? The uh, Stromata, for example, Clement, Clement of Alexandria oh. Stromata is a bit like that. Uh, stromata means patchwork, patchwork which is a kind of, you know, you take all sorts of sayings together, and, and he actually, it's interesting because uh, Clement of Alexandria's hermeneutics, 
He's going to explain his hermeneutic principle. He's going to talk about the principle of the veil. And um, scripture functions as a veil. And it's only those that penetrate the veil that will like, be able to kind of un uncover and unfold the meaning. And it's purposefully hidden in order for you to attract you to engage it mm -hmm. so that it unfolds. When you engage in it, you're kind of caught in this web. And it, it pushes you from one thing, one theme to another, and, and you're, it's like what I was describing, this kind of Russian, you know, Russian doll. And it's one thing connected to the other. So yes, Stromata is a good example of that. I would go as, I, I would even explore the, the, the theme of uh, the, uh, the, the Desert Fathers. The Desert Fathers that, that would be good too. I think there has been work done. How about uh, the Gospel of Philip? Gospel of Philip yeah. functions a bit like that too. Yeah, it's, and the Gospel of Philip, yes, Gospel of Philip, yeah. my colleague Louis Pinchot that's actually doing the commentary on Philip, uh, looked at, at the work that I was doing on Thomas, he says Philip functions a bit the same way. Mm -hmm. He must have uh, to physically tear the book apart and yeah. rearrange it. That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Is there a role, yeah. Paula? Yeah. Is there a role for arrows here in drawing your attention? I mean, you talk about penetrating the veil, it, it's, this is, we're talking about divine feminism. Yeah, yeah. It's gendered language, mm -hmm. um, and I know that gendered language is used in some of these texts, and it's used in kind of a neurotic way yeah. um, to, draw, to draw attention to um, draw the individuals yeah. to the divine. Yeah. Do you think that plays a role? Really More the, maybe the issue around wisdom, yes. Um, but again, I'd be very, I, I'd be more prudent with Thomas because of Lo, uh, there's Logia 114, uh, oh, which uh, you know, which has a problem with Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's the thing is it's it's the um, you know it's the philosophical system of the day in the sense that the male the male component is seen as the higher realm as the female uh, element is seen as the carnal more. Uh, sensual element that that's not in tune with the divine so it's it's using that kind of representation in Thomas you see especially 114 some people would argue that even saying 114 is a later edition mm. because you have saying 113 and saying three that functions a very like a very nice inclusion like an inclusio between like they answer each other everything in between fits very well. And then you have this awkward 114 where Mary is kind of devalued. But I would go more with wisdom, like the figure of Sophia. Wisdom calling. Yeah, wisdom calling. Uh, I, I, yeah, as a feminine figure, that's more where I would go with, with Thomas or what I see in Thomas. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you had a question, sir? Yeah. And then, yes. So I really dig how you're approaching this. Thank it, you. I'm going to be up all night. <laughs> and uh, I kind of did, I did do something very similar to the Gospel of Philip uh, yes. a couple of years ago. Yes. And comparing it to the rights of it, I hope you know about it. I've used it, so there's some really fascinating comparisons. So, but my question is, and maybe you address this, and I just, it just had to went over my head. <laughs> so if we're talking about a collection of sayings, it's usually assumed to come from an oral tradition or an oral community or something yeah. like that. But here you're talking about the only way really to do this is to have a book in front of you. What this is yeah. that you're talking about, you can't really do it orally because we know that oral traditions don't, they're not memorized, this doesn't work that way. Yeah. So how do you explain taking oral traditions, writing it, and then, and then putting it together? And yeah. what do you think about the community that would have done that? Did it come about before, after, anything like that? Yeah, this is a very good question because this is, again, uh, around the issue of how this, this text came about. Uh, there has been some scholarship done, especially by uh, some uh, Scandinavians. Um, I'm thinking about the, the, the work of uh, Risto Uro. He's been working, he has worked on Thomas many, many years. Now he hasn't been, he, he left Tom, the Thomas uh, scene, it's been 10 years or so. But uh, he, he talked a lot about uh, oral performance, performative, uh, these sayings are performative in the sense that um, many of these sayings are performative. Uh, you repeat a lot of what you say and you act upon what you say. For example, there's a saying, um, I think uh, it's saying 37. Uh, 
if you want to see the living one, you have to be like little children and undress yourself and stamp on your clothes. And then you will have a vision of the living one. So there is an element of performance there that could have tied, a, you know, orality to that, you see? But I think that um, the text itself, the way we do it, it has to be something that people read. Even, like, even the insipid, whoever, like, he wrote them down. You see, these are the hidden sayings that Jesus spoke mm. and that Didymus, Judas, Thomas wrote down. Yeah. yeah. So there's the, there, there's the importance of even talking about the writing down of the sayings mm -hmm. and then bringing the idea of interpretation right after. Like, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience that. So they have to have been written down to be able to engage in that interpretation. So for me, uh, I think you can only understand this through people that either read in a community, in a communal setting, or had copies mm -hmm. uh, and read the text. And they engaged in this kind of ascetic way of thinking and 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 I would say even performing elements of what the text is saying about certain so things. You think it might have been a, a sort of a seated community. I'm thinking about. That. Yes, there's a, a, a community. Yes, asceticism. Yes, yes, a kind of. A, yes, because there are uh, there's issues around abstention. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are people that even put Thomas as incratic. Uh, in the sense of uh, incretism, uh, 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 to abstain one, uh, oneself from sexual activity, from uh, from wine, from certain you know types of foods and activities, uh, incretism. It was tied to attention in the second century. So uh, so there could be that too. It's hard because the thing is, you don't have a lot of like since there's not a lot of narrative. You don't have a handle on much. You see, with a narrative, sometimes you have protagonists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have things. The narrative can inform you of the setting. Like, we know a lot of the stuff about the Gospels, for example, because there's, a, there's narratives, there's parables that recount stories that are tied to historical events, like the fall of Jerusalem. There's the eschatological discourse of Jesus in, in Luke 21, Matthew uh, uh, 24, and... Uh, uh, Mark 13, things like that, and we can tie that to events, and we can we can we can put a certain setting. Thomas, it's harder. There are glimpses, uh, there there are glimpses of things that that can speak of a particular setting, but again, you got to be even careful when he talks about not rebuilding the temple. At one point, there's one of the sayings there. He's he's talking about destroying this house. It will never be rebuilt. Um, some scholars argue that he ha this saying had to be produced only after the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt mm -hmm. in 132. You see, because the temple was never to be rebuilt after that revolt. You see, so there are glimpses of things that can give you a possible setting, but it's hard to have a handle. So you almost have only the insipid of, of what the text says about itself and say to yourself, okay, I could, I could, you know, I could take this text and try to do what it says we should do and see what, what, what's going to come out of it. So the, the lack of narrative actually invites you to take these and put it in the context I, of your own life. I think so. I, I yeah. think this is a text where the reader has to actively participate in the meaning. Mm -hmm. There's no, it's, it's not like, it's not given. It's, you have to construct. Where you read the Gospels, you know, Jesus gives you interpretations of parables, and even the, you have the narrator jumping in, giving you an explanation of what Jesus did or said in what context. Just in case you didn't get it. Huh? Just yeah, in case you didn't get it. Just in case you get, didn't get it. At one point, you have, a, uh, you know, an interpolation from the narrator. In the middle of the eschatological discourse in, in, uh, in Mark 13, the narrator, in the middle of what Jesus is saying, he's going to say, let the reader understand. Like right in the middle of the eschatological discourse. So he, he wants the reader to understand 
that this is tied to a particular context here. Don't mix it up with something else. Right, see? Right, right. So, but in Tom, it's very hard to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that make sense what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, I'd love to be able to kind of situate this more firmly, but it's hard yeah, well, it's due hard. to the nature of this. It's hard, it's hard to put anyone into any kind of community. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yes? Um, on the end of saying two, sometimes I've seen added and then he will rest. Yes, yes, um, because that's the, uh, that's the Greek version. A Greek. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, you see when we, uh, when we have, uh, when we can work comparatively with the Oxyrhynchus papyri, sometimes you're gonna see little differences here. So why do we go from rest uh, to, uh, to the all or something like that? And sometimes it's a misreading uh, so, so the people that explain, for example, that uh, the, 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 the Coptic scribe misread the Greek uh, term here, mm. which is very similar to rest. So, and he, trans and he put rest instead of all or something, or the other way around. So that happens. Okay. Um, and you're going to see variants sometimes, little variants like that. The, the, the transmission history of that text is very complex because we have three independent Greek scraps of mm -hmm. fragments and one Coptic text. So it's like what's in between of them? It, it, it becomes like a nightmare for scholars yeah. to kind of figure this out. And scholars have been trapped in this quicksand of source, redaction, dating, yeah, yeah, yeah. they've been stuck in that forever. And I'm sure the next commentaries that are gonna come out is gonna be that again. And it's like, you ne you're not gonna solve, you're not gonna solutionize this. You're not, we don't have enough. We need more stuff, we need more manuscripts, we need you know, to be able to do compare. With the Gospels, it's easy. You have like just Greek text from the Gospels, you have over 8,500 you know, mm -hmm. various texts just in Greek without counting all the other languages that comes up to 25,000. So you can do something with that. You can do a critical edition with the New Testament. With Thomas, you gotta pretty much rely on the Coptic text. Yes? Speaking of, speaking of not mixing things up, is there any connection in fact or fiction between the Thomas that, yeah. you, that we're reading about here and the so-called doubting Thomas of the Gospels who put his finger in Jesus' wounds as well? Yeah. The thing is, that's not always clear. Um, there are people that make those connections. There is a tradition where this Thomas that you're talking about, the, the doubting Thomas, in a Syriac translation of the Gospel of John when they talk about Thomas, they're going to refer to Thomas the same way mm -hmm. as he's referred in the, in the Gospel of Thomas, with the Didymus, you know, all of that. So some people will say, ah, you know, there might be a Syriac connection with Thomas because of the Syriac that we have from the Gospel of John. We have a, you know, a Syriac text of the Gospel of John, and he's named that way in that Syriac text as he's named in the Coptic. And, and Greek version. But it's very difficult. We don't have, there's nothing in the, the text of Thomas that would necessarily lend itself for or against that in Thomas itself, in the gospel itself of Thomas. Does that make sense? Is that helpful, what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so I guess the yeah. only thing is yeah. that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, the one in the yeah. text here. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I read something that I'm trying to remember. Yeah. That, that, that this this Thomas is is has a has a uh, a questioning, uh, interrogating attitude, and you have to get right into it. And yeah. And the other Thomas in the Gospel is also depicted as a questioning, uh, but although although in a negative way. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The doubting Thomas is like doubting mm -hmm. him. He has insight yeah. into the things of Jesus that the other disciples don't. Yeah. So it's a kind of a reversal a bit. Uh -huh. At the same time, this Thomas, he's Didymus, he's, he's, he's a twin. Uh, you have the Acts of Thomas, which is another 
another apocryphal text where you have this guy going around, Thomas, that people um, uh, misidentify and think he, they're, he's Jesus. Mm -hmm. So they, they see Jesus at one point in one place, then Jesus leaves, then Thomas appears, and, uh, hey, I thought you left. No, no, you didn't. No, you saw my twin brother. It's Jesus. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's very funny. It's a bit funny, the Acts of Thomas for that. Um, but they, that's it. It's hard to, to really make that association because there's nothing in the text itself that would, would say that or not. Yeah. We can if we want, but... <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah, uh, first off, I, I want to thank you for giving us all eternal life and we'll taste that. <laughs> yeah. uh, the inner meaning of, of this text. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. So, exactly. Um, but also that, that crafty craftsman, the demiurge hiding out in texts. You mentioned a few places where it yeah. might be hiding. Some scholars see them in it. And of course, you can't say yes or no, I know. It's, but I think it's probable. <laughs> saying seven, there's a very mystifying saying about yeah. a, the man who the lion eats is cursed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the demiurge is often shown with a lion's head. So some scholars have said, if you're consumed by the demiurge, you're cursed. Did you find that probable? It, it is a possibility. It yeah. is one, one interpretation that has been given on this text. Um, but it, it could go even beyond that. Let's say you wouldn't associate the, the, the lion figure to the demiurge. You could just associate it to the general idea that it, that it expresses. Like, don't be consumed by the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, and 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 if you are, you're cursed. Yes. And 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 but you consume the world instead. You see, and and yes. but don't let it eat you. So yeah. it could be that too. But yes, it's plausible. Yeah. It's very hard to to you know to to make that direct link, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. Anything else or? So much more, but there isn't time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, time flies in good company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.